Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Thank you. So seven and a half billion. That's the number of people who live on the earth today. 32 years from now, in 2050, that number is likely to be more than nine and a half billion and approaching 10 billion. So we're going to go from seven and a half billion to 10 billion in 32 short years. People, we are 60% water. We're mostly bags of water. And everybody eats. Now, I don't know where you're going to be in 32 years or where I'm going to be, but I can guarantee us all that we're still going to be eating and drinking. And figuring out how to produce enough food and clean water for 10 billion people in the next 32 years is a really big challenge. Now, here in America, we take our food for granted. We expect to be able to go to the grocery store or the market and get anything we want pretty much any time. We do understand that many parts of the world have shared in our plenty. Our agricultural system is the envy of the world. It's incredibly productive. But we also know that there are parts of the world that live in extreme poverty where malnutrition is rampant. There are places where food cannot be, enough food can't be produced for the people who live there, and those people are dependent on imports from other countries. Even in America, we have situations where there's food scarcity. There, there are areas of urban decay. Some are small and scattered, and others are vast and undeniable. And what happened in Flint, Michigan to the water supply was a real problem. So even in America, we should not take our food and our water for granted. So feeding, meeting the world's demand for food and water in 20, 50, 32 years from now, that's a big problem. What are we going to do? One thing is for certain. We cannot continue to do what we do right now. There's not enough fertile, arable land on our planet to just scale up agriculture. And so if we want to succeed at meeting the demand for food in the future, we need to reinvent agriculture. We need to reinvent food manufacturing, and we need to think about water resource management. How are we going to do that? That's a big job. How are we going to do that? I'm going to talk about three ways. And the first thing that we could do is to share the knowledge that we already have. We know how to do some really cool things in agriculture. We know how to do precision agriculture. We know how to do drip irrigation. We know how to do a lot of, lot of really neat things. We know how to control farm vehicles remotely, do remote, remote plowing and harvesting. And what we need to do is share that technology and that information with places in the world that don't know about it or have yet to adopt it. This is not a big problem. It's a problem of education and outreach. It might be hampered by, hampered by language barriers or political situations, but on the big scale of what we need to do, this one is doable. It's a communication issue. It has to do with the words we use and how we should choose to share them. The second strategy that we need to use is to take technologies that are being developed in other areas and apply them to food production. So areas like engineering or computer science, biomedicine, information technology are making rapid advances that can be applied to our agricultural system if we set up the right collaborations. Tissue engineering, stem cell research, nanotechnology, data science, genome sciences, all of these can make a huge difference in plant production, animal husbandry, in helping us to design devices that will monitor the safety of our food on the shelf and in our refrigerators and in our lives. And data science promises to help us figure out supply chain logistics and get food all over the world where it needs to be. Agriculture is not a separate science. It shouldn't be sequestered away in a particular college or viewed as different from other sciences. 
No, we need people who are trained in engineering, math, chemistry, biology, computer science, all of those areas to go out to the best universities and colleges, get the best possible training they can, and then come together to solve these problems of producing enough food and water for the world. It's the second strategy. The third strategy is to develop completely new technologies that are driven by the needs of agriculture, but that have never been thought of before or never really done robustly. One example is to figure out how to really efficiently convert seawater to a form that we can drink. Now, people already know how to desalinate seawater, but it costs a lot of money, and it's not very efficient. It takes a lot of energy to do it. 97% of the Earth's water is in the oceans. So we really don't have a water shortage. We just have a potable water shortage. And we need to think about how to do that conversion much more efficiently. Do you think we could produce food in a structure like a great big fancy greenhouse where weather wouldn't matter? Come hailstorm, no problem. Where we wouldn't have to put in very many inputs. We would use no pesticides. We would have almost no waste. And we would be using energy that we could recover so that we weren't wasting it. And so our food, the footprint of producing our food would be very, very small. Can you imagine that we could produce food on a space station? Could we think of ways to trigger human satiety, that feeling that you're full in a big me after a meal, so that something like obesity would be a human affliction like polio, something that you're going to read about in a history book? Can we unleash your imaginations and give you incentives and help you make that list much longer than it is? Your creativity and ingenuity is greatly needed to solve this problem. Now, I know you're independent school kids. You have a great future ahead of you. But that does not let you off the hook right now. So there are some things that you can do right now. I want to talk about those for a minute. First, I think you can be really aware and knowledgeable about the situation. You can understand that we take our food for granted. We understand that there's starvation in the world, but it's at somebody else's in their kitchens and in their dinner tables. Understand that we cannot hope for a peaceful and free world where, where society, there isn't war and people respect each other as long as we have people walking the earth who are hungry and thirsty and don't have enough of these basic needs. Um, we need to, if we continue to allow American agriculture to move offshore, following precedents that have been set in other manufacturing sectors, then our food supply is going to be dependent on trade agreements and world politics. We could find ourselves competing for food, something we've never done in America. Food safety is at the very core of human health. We should have zero tolerance for contaminants in our food, things like microbial contaminants, or pesticide residues, or toxic chemicals, even ones that might be produced by a plant itself. We should have zero tolerance for that. In a world where terrorism threatens, food and water are Achilles heels. And finally, we need to be aware, we need to always be thinking about about this problem. It's not so acute as some of the others that bother us, but when we think about societal concerns, we all have our individual lists, but I bet that own them are gun violence and global warming and crime in the streets and threats from disease pandemics. Please add food security. By that I mean food security means the ability to get the food and water that you need. Add that to the list. And remember that 2% of the American population produces all the food that all of us eat. So when you say your graces and you enjoy food with friends and family, don't forget to be thankful for the people who produced it. It's very hard work. The second thing that you can do is not waste food and water. 
So think about food waste for a minute. From the time that we plant seeds in the ground and grow the crops and then harvest them, how much do we leave in the field? And then we move that food, we distribute it or we process it, and it ends up in a grocery store. How much never makes it through the cash register to the consumer? But it ends up staying in the dairy counter or in the meat counter or the produce counter or maybe the back counters, and it never gets bought. And so it's wasted there. And then when, for the food that we bring home, how much of it sadly gets forgotten in the back of our refrigerators, never cooked and never eaten? And on our own plates, how much do we throw in the garbage? So the answer to that is way too much. Okay, can we agree the answer to that is way too much? And so all of us, food is wonderful, cooking is fun. We all love to eat, we should but we need to be mindful of wasting food and try not to do that. Now, the third thing I think you can do is you can consider dedicating yourself and your career to solving this problem. There are jobs in this field, and there will continue to be jobs in this field. The problem is not going away. We need people like you to go out and get the best possible education in an area that is very challenging for you, but very fun. It could be math. It could be chemistry, it could be medicine, it could be all kinds of things. And then we need groups of people to come together and to work together to solve this problem. Meeting the world's demand for food and water in the future is going to be a big challenge and we need the brightest minds around to do it. Now I'm going to end by talking about this problem as a school assignment because I know you have school assignments all the time. So first of all, it's required. It's not an elective. So you can't opt out of this course. Second, there won't be any part credit for a sort of half-baked answer or something that we didn't really do our best on. No one's going to curve the grade on this assignment. Okay? Third, you can use any resource you can find. And by all means, you can work together. We can all work together. But together, we have to get an A+. Plus. And fourth, we, we, procrastination is just unacceptable. This is not an assignment that we can put off to the last minute. We can't even put it off till later. The time to work on this assignment is right now. So 32 years from now, in 2050, when the world population is approaching 10 billion people, I hope we do things differently. And I hope that we will all look back and be very, very proud of the awesome advances that your generation is going to make. It's really important. Ten and a half billion people are depending on what we do. Thank you very much. <laughs>